I am Ha Young Sun from Seoul National University. So we're beginning the second uh, session for the Korea Global Forum for Peace 2020. We'll be talking about the paradigm shift for peace and dispute resolution on the Korean Peninsula. Let us now begin session two. First of all, I'd like to welcome our five panelists. I'd like to deliver my greetings to you, and we will begin our panel discussion. Our pa uh, panelists have been selected through a very rigorous screening process, and uh, they do a lot of research on peace on the Korean Peninsula, and also do lots of uh, peace-related um, research around the world. So we're very happy to have invited our panelists. And according to our program proceedings, we're going to first listen to uh, Mr. Dan Smith, who's a director at CIPRI. And then our second uh, panelist is uh, from ISDP director, Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom. And our third panelist is from Finland, CMI Crisis Management Initiative, Mr. Valet Rumer. And the fourth panelist is from the Czech Republic Global Coordinator for the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Disarmament. So we're joined by four panelists from abroad who have uh, connected to our online channel. Last but not least, from Korea, we have uh, Dr. Seobo Hyuk, who's a researcher working at the Korean Institute for National Unification, Kino. So before we begin uh, the forum, I would like to just touch upon a few things. And I believe that the second session of the forum is probably one of the most relevant, important uh, sessions. Of course, I'm not saying that other sessions are less important than this one, but I th think, nonetheless, this is probably the most important one. The reason is that if we're to think about the peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula, there are uh, four dimensions of complexities at hand. First of all, as you can see, that we're wearing masks, all of us joining from Seoul. So across the globe, first of all, uh, there's a spread of COVID-19 and its new implications on a new global order. And this requires global discussion in earnest. And against this backdrop, we're here to talk about peace again on the Korean Peninsula with a renewed and different perspective, I believe. Second reason is that in the Asia Pacific region, there's a changing dynamics between uh, China and the United States and the relations are aggravating very fast. If you look at the relations between the two countries over the last few months, especially from some experts' point of view, uh, they're quite concerned that the relations may even go to that point of the Cold War regime. So it really requires a very cautious uh, stance indeed in terms of peace and unification of the Korean Peninsula. I think the relations between the United States and China um, is going to be very important in that regard. The third reason is that even against this uh, situation, we need to think about the improved relations uh, between the two Koreas. We need to have a pr practical um, improvement, yet that improvement process really requires a long time. Uh, North Korea sometimes takes a very prudent and sometimes quite passive uh, stance to improving the relations with uh, the South Korean counterpart. So it is in that very difficult situation. The fourth difficulty that we face is that with all these complex problems at hand, uh, domestically speaking, do we really, uh, we're at a crossroad as to whether we should take a hardline stance or to take a softer uh, stance uh, towards this issue, which would require national consensus of the Korean citizens, because there are four different dimensions to this complex problem 
unless we really pursue a new type of a paradigm, we will not be able to transcend beyond these difficult issues. So it is high time that we come up with a new paradigm. Second reason is that there will be three-day uh, long form, but this session is going to be very important indeed because uh, we'll be looking at many proposals from the Korean perspectives. And in order for any solutions to be very effective, we cannot but help to think about and to rethink our paradigm. And that talk has to be based on new values. And the final thought I want to share with you is that our session may uh, actually end up providing a quite skeptical outlook on the future of the Korean Peninsula, but my personal note is that in 1986 and 1987, I was uh, working at a Stockholm uh, Peace Research Institute as a visiting professor for one year, uh, even in Korea as well as in Cypri. Uh, relevant parties were saying that when there is that tension between the two Koreas, how do you afford the luxury uh, to learn about the arms reduction uh, from a country in Europe? Well, actually, back then, I wasn't able to give a good answer to that question. But two years after I came back from Sweden, and right after the Seoul Olympics in 1988, there was a agreed uh, framework um, issue between the two Koreas. And then uh, we had a discussion on arms reduction uh, there were much uh, discussions and talks between the two Koreas. The DPRK and South Korea, of course, back then were not fully ready. So I had to really rely upon very uh, rudimentary uh, concepts that I learned from Europe uh, from the 1970s, I believe. So with researchers and government officials, I was um, ha had to actually share those thoughts with the government officials back then. So this session is not just going to be a one-off event, and I believe that this is going to be very instrumental in our future discussions on the topic. With that help, I would like to begin the session. So this is how I'm going to proceed with the session. I've received a talking points from our five panelists in advance. Uh, there were very interesting notes here. And as long as there is enough time for all of us, each panelist will be given uh, 10 minutes each in the first round to maybe summarize their views. So that will be about 50 to 60 minutes to go with one round of discussion. And then we will have a second round of discussion afterwards. If possible, I will pose a one point question just one critical uh, question that I want to ask you. And we will be able to deal with any uh, issues uh, pending from the first round of discussion. So three to five minutes will be given to each panelist in the second round to respond to my questions. And then if there is any time left afterwards, we will open the floor and then we'll be getting questions from the participants, especially focusing on areas where we were not able to touch upon in the first and the second round of discussion. And with that, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Dan Smith from CIPRI for your 10-minute talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And it's a pleasure to be joining you, other panelists and other participants. Uh, for this session of the forum. And uh, I, congratulations to the ministry and to the government of South Korea for organizing it. It's interesting, your remarks uh, drawing on your thoughts coming out of CIPRI in the 1980s, because in some ways, uh, my remarks uh, pick up on that theme. I want to start by saying that it's, I think it's perfectly obvious for all of us that there are ser serious security challenges and dilemmas on and around the Korean Peninsula. They are highly visible. There are continuing incidents between North and South Korea at the moment in a context in which no peace settlement has been reached, and in fact in which the inter-Korean detente seems to have 
slowed down and deteriorated badly. North Korea's nuclear weapons development is an obvious issue, as are the responses to it. There's a military force buildup on more than one side in the region, more generally. There are uncertainties and disputes about territory between China and Japan in the East China Sea. And there is the still unsettled dispute between Japan and Russia over the Kuril Islands. And then further afield, there's obviously the continuing disputes and incidents in the South China Sea. Now, these challenges all make each other worse. They make each one harder to handle. And they're made particularly difficult to resolve because of the toxic nature of current geopolitical relations. The first two decades after the end of the Cold War included some major steps forward for peace and arms reduction worldwide. But the third decade of the post-Cold War era has seen multiple negative developments. Military spending is at the highest level now that it has been since the end of the Cold War. The arms trade is at the highest level that it has been since the end of the Cold War. And the number of armed conflicts each year is back to the level that it was in the late 1980s. All of these factors make it harder to see a way clear to peaceful settlement of issues in troubled regions, whether we're thinking about the, the Gulf or in the Middle East or about South Asia or about Northeast Asia. In addition, on top of that, as you have also mentioned in your introduction, comes the COVID-19 pandemic, with not just its human cost, but its impact on, first of all, on the economies of leading countries and of the world as a whole. And secondly, its impact on the culture of contact between different countries. How, will, how much will we be traveling in future? Will we have the same amount of interaction as we did in the past, or perhaps even more, but in different ways? There is a whole series of consequences as yet unknown uh, of the pandemic, and they do nothing to make the situation more simple at the moment. So there are grounds for considerable uncertainty about how best to move forward for conflict resolution uh, in the face of all of these issues. Uh, should is it wiser to start with specific issues or is it better to go immediately to the general problem? So, general strategic choice which has to be made uh, in the Korean Peninsula, in the broader region and in, in all such cases. Should the focus be on resolving specific disputes or is it about, find, is the best way to go about it by finding common ground between as many actors as possible? Should one start with small steps to begin with and build on to bigger things? Or is the best thing to do to start at the highest level of ambition on the grounds that nothing is gained by avoiding the big problems? I think one thing to stress is that these dilemmas are not new. And as I think you were pointing out, similar issues had to be faced in the European context in the 1970s. There was a considerable amount of diplomatic work undertaken before a general approach emerged, which was to undertake talks simultaneously on mutual reductions of conventional forces, i.e. the non-nuclear forces in Europe, and to establish the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I guess that the question that you were asking yourself in the 1980s is the same as I am asking myself and others asked themselves 30 years later, which is, does that approach from Europe, way back, offer something for today in a different region? When looking back to that period and considering its relevance for contemporary security politics, analysts often make two mistakes. The first one is that they forget the force reduction talks, and the second one is that they misinterpret the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. Now, it's really easy to forget the force reduction talks, because they never produced an agreement. In fact, the NATO and the Warsaw Pact powers never agreed on a convenient short title for the talks. NATO always referred to them as the Mutual and Balanced Force Reduction Talks, and the USSR rejected that term, especially the word balanced. 
However, the very fact that the issue of conventional forces was recognized and addressed, even if ineffectively over a period of about 14 years, underlined the notion that the military problem uh, was risky and it needed to be managed. The second error that analysts make is to read back from what happened at the end of the Cold War and to depict the Conference on Security and Cooperation as a measure designed to end the confrontation between East and West. It was not. It never was designed for that purpose because no end to the confrontation between East and West was foreseen in the mid-1970s. The Conference on Security and Cooperation was designed to manage the confrontation, to make it safer. A decade before Glasnost and Perestroika in the USSR, a decade before any reasonable person had rational grounds for thinking that something would change fundamentally in the Soviet Union, no end to confrontation was foreseen. But what was hoped for, planned for, and worked for was a safer form of confrontation. And perhaps that's approximately where we now are in Northeast Asia. In the end, I suppose, one may wish for an ambitious structure of security cooperation in Northeast Asia. But there is a case for something less ambitious today, a framework of contact and exchange that could be a step towards managing disputes, rivalry, and keep confrontation at a lower level of risk, both for the region and, therefore, for the world. This could take the form this framework of a continuing conference among the major security actors, the five regional states plus the USA. Like the Conference on Security and Cooperation, it could discuss confidence measures, such as advance warning of maneuvers and secure hotlines. It could discuss other kinds of exchanges. It could certainly discuss humanitarian effects. Whether it moved from there to something more far-reaching would become clear in time in a time that at the moment, I certainly cannot foresee, but might hope for. It would be valuable, this framework, even if it does not pave the way for more far-reaching measures, and it would be invaluable if it were to do so. Those are my remarks for this session. Thank you very much. I look forward to the continuing discussion. Thank you very much. The uh, historical experiences of European countries in the 70s leading on to uh, actual outcomes in the 1980s, I think uh, that was what Mr. Smith said in his remarks. And hopefully they could have implications for Northeast Asia and for Korean Peninsula. I think that is a very interesting uh, comment and definitely something that we must uh, listen to. And our second speaker is Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom. Could you begin uh, your presentation, please? So, well, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and the chairman for uh, inviting me um, to this fantastic um, conference. And of course, apologize for not being able to participate in the morning, but uh, it was slightly too early for Swedish time. Um, and then, of course, I also hope uh, that everybody is safe. Now we have, of course, the amazing typhoon hitting South Korea as well as, as with COVID-19. But I, I will, in a sense, boringly sort of build upon uh, Dan Smith a bit. And um, I'm going to talk a bit on uh, the Korean Peninsula in particular. But uh, what I'm going to offer is not a perfect solution. Um, it's definitely not a resolution. Um, I'm sort of a, very much a small steps person in, in this case. Uh, it's rather a path forward as I see it, because um, I don't see denuclearization, I don't see a resolution being possible. And I think that that's exactly also what Dan was sort of alluding to or spec specifying very clearly to, uh, not alluding. Um, so what we have is, uh, we have a we do have a geostrategic shift in uh, in the region where China is taking uh, a great role, um, and this is not necessarily bad or good. Uh, that's not sort of the argument here, but we see a 
tension rising between the two great powers that has made um, a resolution or action on the Korean Peninsula extremely difficult. We saw that before the Olympic Games in uh, South Korea that it was a tr sort of a movement forward because we had a fairly unified international position on the Korean Peninsula. We do not have that today. I mean, the what we see is a polarization that is in actually very much in favor of uh, DPRK. And um, the power politics here is, is creating a bit of, uh, call it leeway for DPRK. Um, but great powers are absolutely essential for dealing with or resolving the Korean Peninsula. Without China, without the United States, we can't really move anything forward. Despite that, I, I do argue for multilateralism. Um, even if that has not been uh, in the cards uh, earlier for uh, Northeast Asia, and I'm not very positive about it for the future either. But as Stan was saying, it's would it be successful? It's invaluable. Uh, but the exercise in itself is also useful. It's about building that sort of um, dialogues, the, these sort of uh, contact points in uh, between North Korea and the outside world. And then, of course, it comes up, what can be done? Well, I mean, there's no short-term solutions that, that we can see. Uh, North Korea, I would argue, has never been ready to denuclearize denuclearized and will not be in the future either. Uh, but I do see human security. And when I say human security, I see that in the wider uh, spectrum. Uh, COVID-19, natural disasters, socioeconomic development. And this is even now today when you're in contact with Pyongyang, you do get a very clear indication that there's a big concern over COVID-19 um, Maysak Typhoon is another one. They've been sort of indicating clearly that they would. Th this is a big concern. And I think this is actually the path forward where we can try to build that sort of dialogue. But, of course, this is, uh, could be a big concern. I mean, not only this, this, will this not resolve any of the issues, uh, it could also potentially strengthen North Korea. Uh, there's going to be a great concern for that in Washington, D.C. in particular. That said, the disaster management uh, is one of the few areas where we can actually see a possibility of engagement and the willingness for DPRK side. And... Uh, it's also something that is potentially not included in the sanction list. So for me, these small steps, this direct engagement, trying to avoid rather than to focus on the big issues is a way forward to, to build that sort of trust between the actual actors. And I also think this is one of the few ways for South Korea to re-engage with North Korea. Uh, there's been a lack of interest from DPRK to engage with South Korea. Um, simply because it's not considered to be relevant in the um, denuclearization discussions or peace negotiations. But this is actually one of the issues where I think that South Korea could take the lead and to build a stronger fundament for engagement and, and dialogue. But this is as I said, it's no resolution. It's not necessarily a, um, a long-term um, path, even. But this is, I think, r currently the only path forward. And when I say multilateralism here, it's rather a coalition of the willing, uh, where we can actually, in, to a certain extent, include the United States, include China, um, even if currently they're not, I think, extremely useful. But it's also management of expectations. 
I think we have to be realistic when it comes to DPRK that we're not going to see any tremendous changes. And um, I think we also have to be realistic with the fact that the current situation is actually beneficial for DPRK. There's no reason for them to re-engage too much because as long as power politics is as it is with a clear divide between the United States and China, they are able to manipulate the situation. And they've been doing that for decades and they're extremely good at it. So, and again, when speaking to DPRK and, and I get very little indication that they're willing to do more than this short term um, until we have a greater sort of international consensus how to move forward. And I, I, I unfortunately don't see that. So I'm actually it's a bit pessimistic here and I, I strongly focus us then on, on sort of the, the small steps and actually the South Korean leadership role because Long term, I think the, the South Koreans are the only one that is willing and able to provide that sort of platform. And I will end here with my, my first remarks. Thank you very much. East Asia and the Korean Peninsula situations are very closely examined by Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom. Based on his perspective of the region, he pointed out very uh, specific solutions uh, for the Korean Peninsula. So perhaps we can come back to this uh, topic uh, during the discussion session later on. Let me do CMI program. Next, we'd like to move on uh, to Ville Brumer from Finland. I'll hand over the microphone to you. Hello, good morning from Finland and good day. Uh, and, uh, uh, both from the personal perspective and from the uh, CMS perspective, uh, uh, we are very honored to uh, to participate in the in the conference here, and hopefully in the future we can also <laughs> also participate uh, physically uh, as well. But I think that this is an excellent opportunity for for all of us to exchange ideas and see <laughs> see what the, the uh, future challenges and opportunities in the in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, in general, I think that the, um, uh, I don't want to sound naive, but um, uh, I think that uh, uh, my profession is to, to be an optimist as well. <laughs> so so uh, acknowledging all the challenges, I think that the, uh, there's always need, uh, some need for, for optimism as well. And um, I think that the, how, Optimism, I see optimism there is that um, uh, when uh, describing the world uh, uh, as now heading towards the, the Cold War uh, between US and China, um, I think that we have to acknowledge the, the third <laughs> element of, of that process, uh, the, the rest of the world, <laughs> which actually is not so happy uh, 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 with the progress. Uh, where, uh, where the scenario is that there's a two major powers uh, uh, dictating all the uh, fields from um, economy, uh, security, to technology and, and, and political systems, and then the uh, rest of the countries should uh, choose either or. <laughs> but I think that there, there is an ongoing a third way of, uh, of uh, thinking. <laughs> Uh, where I think that uh, uh, it's visible both in the countries like uh, maybe Nordic countries where, which are emphasizing strong uh, uh, multilateral approaches and, and balancing act, uh, from that side, as well as in, in countries we are, which are going towards the more nationalistic tendencies and, um, and the maybe more self-reliant systems. And I think that the, um, uh, these are the responses both on the both ends, which I think that uh, are there and will be there for a while when looking at the Chinese-US uh, competition. And I think that the uh, looking at the uh, uh, peace process in, in Korean Peninsula, I think that the historically and also in the future, 
I think that the um, the peace process is not only linked to the uh, U.S.-China's competition, but I think that it's closely linked also to the uh, questions of how each country could balance uh, uh, the acts of the two states and what kind of uh, coalitions and self-dependent <laughs> measures can be built uh, uh, to manage that situation. So I think that the um, and that's a, a, how, how to say where I see a lot of opportunities in the peace process uh, compared to the framing the uh, world through the U.S.-Chinese uh, competition. I think that the second uh, um, point which I, I, I want to mention, I think that the OSCE uh, and the European security architect that was uh, mentioned by uh, Dan Smith, um, and I fully agree on, on his assessment on the, on the OSC and the evolution. However, I think that um, uh, 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 to that to be beneficial analysis, I think that the, uh, one should go a bit deeper on, on what the European security architect actually consists of. And um, I think that while the OSCE provides um, principle framework, <laughs> and legitimacy for the cooperation. I think that um, uh, the, um, uh, the real cooperation and uh, political technical cooperation, political alliances are actually much more diverse under the, um, under the uh, uh, OSCE. For example, example of uh, Nordic countries, <laughs> Firstly, I think that the whole concept of Nordic country <laughs> is a very different for different countries. Whereas, for example, in Finland, uh, the concept Nordic country <laughs> was um, uh, an avenue to the West in the 60s. <laughs> Whereas in, in maybe Norway, it was more like a, a totally different thing. And looking at now the Nordic countries, actually, they all have their own solutions for European cooperation where we have NATO countries, non-NATO countries, EU countries, non-EU countries, Euro countries, no non-Euro countries. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, the European security architect is more like a portfolio <laughs> where each of the country can choose their, um, uh, a plate for cooperation. And I think that this is something uh, which um, I think that would be useful uh, uh, to look at also in the... Um, East Asia uh, context and in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, because I think there's uh, several reasons why uh, 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 there's no <laughs> possibility to create a rigid framework uh, for cooperation between two, six or more countries. But I think that uh, uh, one should look at that more as an option for cooperation where one could build a network <laughs> Of for where each country would choose their own portfolios and then see uh, what's the overall cooperation model in that network approach. The thirdly, I think that the, there was a question of, of, uh, <laughs> of Korea and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, our, our chair was mentioning the question of, of, of should the strategy changed. Um, Personally, I really have admired uh, the Korean approach um, uh, for the past years. And uh, I think that the, um, uh, there have been a very interesting balance of uh, symbolisms and concrete actions, starting from the Olympics, <laughs> um, uh, 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 leaning towards the quite a significant uh, uh, security and defense agreements. However, I think that the, the rest of the world haven't been able to follow such a nuanced approach. But I think that the, uh, in the international community, we are still looking at the, uh, at the situation in, uh, from fully strategic perspective, <laughs> fully economical perspective of something else. And I think that in the future, we should work in the international community as well uh, to find a ways to build a roadmaps where you would have a concrete 
preparatory symbolic actions, better orchestrated uh, uh, in a way uh, that everyone on the same page. Because, for example, looking at the U.S. approach, I think that the Singapore summit was an excellent example of uh, symbolism. <laughs> but unfortunately, the, uh, 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 the uh, administration in U.S. didn't have a way to follow up that in the concrete level. <laughs> And I think that the other governments maybe have had a opposite problems where they have had all the mechanisms, but not the way to, to manage the symbolism. So I think that the, many of the pieces are still there, but we just have to find a way on how to orchestrate in a way which is a more uh, coherent. <coughs> and there, I think that we should really uh, uh, see the, the uh, uh, examples from the Koreas for the past three to four years and learn on how it is done and then see for more thinking on how it could be repeated at the international community. Thank you very much. Uh, comment to yes, yes, that was a very interesting comment. So we're going to invite our fourth speaker. Uh, Mr. Ellen Ware, who is the Global Coordinator for the Parliamentarians uh, for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Disarmament. The floor is yours. Could you begin your presentation, Mr. Ellen Ware? Uh, yes, could I ask the technical people to enable my share screening? Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much. I uh, commend the uh, organizers of uh, this event for uh, a wonderful hybrid uh, conference, having experts uh, both on location in Seoul and also to be able to organize, uh, enable uh, remote participation. Um, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to present. I'm just waiting for the technical support team to enable me to share my screen. Um, for those who have joined remotely, because there are many people who are, are watching this uh, by the streaming, uh, which is uh, what having this system enables. Uh, the, there may be a surprise that this panel only includes males because there are many expert females in the field as well. And I just want to commend the organizers for inviting a lot of fee of women uh, to present in the other panels. And so I encourage those who are watching by streaming to stay on for the other, other panels. Uh, okay, I'm now just going to open up my presentation. Uh, so I'm going to uh, look at primarily the nuclear weapons issue uh, in Northeast Asia uh, and looking beyond the nuclear weapons war, how to achieve peace and security without nuclear deterrence in order to assist a denuclearization process. Uh, I originally come from New Zealand, which was part of a nuclear alliance and has uh, rejected uh, nuclear deterrence and has been able to forge security without nuclear weapons. So I know that that transition is possible and we're not the only country that's done that. So I'll look at some of the dynamics about how that might be playing out and uh, how, to, how there may be some possibilities in Northeast Asia. Uh, firstly, uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence at the moment and historically have been very much a strong part of the political dynamic in Northeast Asia. Uh, it's the only region where nuclear weapons have been used in wartime, uh, the use of nuclear weapons against Japan. It's a region, been a region of superpower rivalry during the Cold War and it continues as a region of conflicts amongst both nuclear armed powers. We've already heard people talking about the tensions and conflicts between China and the US, for example, but also between nuclear powers and non-nuclear powers. Um, and the six main countries in the Northeast Asian region all rely on nuclear deterrence, whether that's they possess nuclear weapons, which is China, DPRK, uh, Russia, and the United States, or under extended nuclear deterrence relationships where they're protected by nuclear weapons, i.e. Japan and the Republic of Korea. Now, there's a lot of difficulties, problems with relying on nuclear weapons. It's a very unstable form of security. It stimulates animosity and distrust. 
It requires a willingness and operational readiness to use nuclear weapons to make that deterrence credible. And that willingness and operational readiness to use nuclear weapons could lead to a catastrophic nuclear exchange, whether it's through miscalculation um, or conflict es escalation, accident, or even infiltration of nuclear command and control systems by a malicious third party. So it's a very unstable form of security. And so why then do countries rely on it? Well, there's three key reasons. Uh, security, to deter an attack from adversaries. Uh, prestige, it gives power and influence. And also there's a money aspect to it, the nuclear weapons lobby. I'm going to focus primarily on security, but I will touch on the money aspect. Security, how this relies is that... Uh, that no one in the region of those six countries appears willing to unilaterally relinquish nuclear deterrence because it would put them at a com competitive disadvantage or a security disadvantage to the others who still rely on nuclear deterrence. In a way, it's like the prisoner's dilemma. And I'll just explain that. The prisoner's dilemma is a classic game theory that was uh, postulated in the 1950s by the Rand Corporation. Uh, and they provided a scenario uh, about two prisoners that had been arrested uh, and they are being charged uh, with, a, with a crime. And they're both offered, they don't have any way of communicating with each other, but they're both offered something that if they one, one of them will snitch, that is report on the other, uh, and the other stays silent, uh, then the one who snitched or reported on the other will go free. They'll be acquitted, found not guilty. And the other one who stayed silent would be convicted and have quite a stiff sentence. Here we look at three years. How if both of the prisoners snitch a report against the other, then they will both be convicted um, and the amount of blame is higher. So they'll get a, a sentence of here we see two years. If they both keep quiet and don't say anything, then they both gain to some degree. Uh, they both get one year um, on conviction. So this is sort of like the outcome, the, the dilemma that the um, prisoners are put in. Do they snitch or not snitch on the other? And in the most probable outcome is that both will snitch in order to avoid the worst possible outcome for themselves if they stayed silent and the other person snitched on them. What this provides is, in a sense, the, uh, the dynamics for a conflict situation and the possible outcomes. Win-lose or lose-win is one of the two of the possible outcomes, and that's a dominance and submission outcome. Competition, where they both lose, or cooperation, where they both win, win-win. So how does this play out with regards to the nuclear weapons in the region? Well, a dominant submission or win-lose outcome would be trying to push one of the countries, or more than one, uh, but not all of them, to unilaterally relinquish the nuclear option putting them at a competitive or security disadvantage to the others. So that would be like pushing DPRK to unilaterally relinquish the nuclear option. And we see they're not willing to do that. Or it's pushing one or more of the six main players to join the new UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And again, we've seen none of the countries of these six are willing to do that. The competition is the status quo. The countries continuing to rely on nuclear deterrence, which could result in something worse. Uh, a nuclear conflict. So the, the model or the outcome that we would hope for is a cooperation win-win, but we see that we need to, for that, we need to have some, some movement by all sides. I, a peace and denuclearization process that reduces or eliminates the role of nuclear weapons and increases the security of all of the relevant parties. Uh, so how, how do we achieve that? Well, there's two aspects to win-win. One is the process and the other is the outcomes. Um, and the process, of course, diplomacy is the key one. And there are a range of different uh, outcome options to aim for. Uh, one of those with regards to nuclear weapons is the idea of a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone, the three plus three model. This has been put forward in the framework of a win-win outcome, i.e. that every country would gain in security and that the role of nuclear weapons would be reduced or eliminated for every country. Um, so it's a little bit different to the other nuclear weaponry zones around the world in that it would require uh, the 
three nuclear armed states in the region, China, Russia, and the United States, to give security guarantees that they would not threaten or use nuclear weapons in the region. And in return, the three territorial states would give up the option of having nuclear weapons or being defended by them. That's Japan, South Korea, and North Korea. It's a very interesting option, and it's something which our network of parliamentarians, and we have members in Japan and South Korea and the United States in particular, have been uh, very uh, interested in exploring further and giving some support for. Um, I won't go through the others. I just will highlight the UN, United Nations Article 33, has a range of mechanisms processes and mechanisms for pursuing a common security or win-win approaches, including UN mediation and then a number of legal mechanisms that can be used to resolve conflicts in ways that uh, diminish the reliance on the threat or use of force or the threat or use of nuclear weapons. Um, and these can be used more and more. So, uh, very quickly, there is a civil society platform that our network of parliamentarians is engaged in to highlight the positive uh, aspects of win-win approaches and the United Nations, and to also connect those with other uh, positives, uh, and that is that uh, peace and disarmament can actually also uh, assist climate protection, sustainable development and COVID-19 recovery and vice versa, that these issues can work together uh, and be self-supporting. And so there's a platform, We the People's 2020, which is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, which is highlighting the better use of UN mechanisms for peace and common security and those connections. And one of those connections is that if we are able to reduce the role of nuclear weapons, we can cut the amount of money that's going into the nuclear weapons budgets, which is uh, at the moment budgeted for budget $1 trillion over the next 10 years. And that money could then be used for sustainable development, for COVID-19 recovery, for public health, for climate protection. Um, and we've mapped out some of the areas where it could make a real concrete difference. A real problem is that the nuclear weapons industry is a lobby to continue the nuclear arms race. It's a very powerful industry, particularly in the United States, but also uh, in the UK and France. Uh, and there's a small number of corporations, about 27 of them, that are lobbying to maintain high nuclear budgets and to keep the nuclear arms race going. So we can address that within the nuclear arms states by looking at uh, a legislative action to cut the budgets. But for the other states, we can use the divestment tool. That is, we can look at our sovereign wealth funds, our pension funds, banks, to stop investing in our private investments in the nuclear weapons corporations and shift those investments to sustainable development. And so that's uh, a, another platform, Move the Nuclear Weapons Money, which is doing that. With that combination of win-win security approaches and addressing the money, cutting the budgets and investments from nuclear weapons and putting them in to peace, disarmament and sustainable development, I think we can tear down the wall of nuclear weapons and help for a more peaceful and denuclearized region and ultimately a denuclearized world. Thank you. This uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, perhaps someone who is uh, really likely the most desperate panelist here. We would like to hear from Mr. Saboyak from Kinu. Thank you very much to our moderator as well as to our panelists joining us from abroad. Because of uh, COVID-19, there is a rise of protectionism around the world as countries are scrambled to try to uh, secure resources for their own uh, countries because of this, uh, resources and food sovereignty are becoming to be seen as one of the same. Now, this is leading to challenges for a multilateral cooperative regime. There is a race for hegemony, hegemony between the U.S. and China, and this is leading to uh, more economic issues as well. 
However, we are seeing many countries around the world, including uh, multilateral institutions such as the UN, uh, including the urge from Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the UN, asking that countries play down their nationalism and play down their protectionism and try to engage in harmony and cooperation with one another. So it's very unlikely for us to see that the uh, this uh, race for hegemony actually lead to armed conflict. Uh, today, I want to talk about the importance of human security, particularly in the light of COVID-19. On May 10th, President Moon Jae-in of the Republic of Korea became the first Korean president to talk about human security in a actual speech. In fact, in his speech given on May 10th, he mentioned the hu expression human security uh, about four times as a center of international cooperation in post-COVID era. Human security as an expanded concept of security from military security and as a common goal for all of humanity and as a new task for inter-Korean cooperation. In fact, at the uh, address that it gave on the 75th anniversary of the independence and liberation of Korea, uh, President Moon Jae-in also talked about human security for inter-Korean cooperation as something that we need to do to create a peace community and economic community and a life community. Human security in terms of inter-Korean cooperation is going to be very difficult because of the regimes, of, of the sanction regime that is in place. So there are some things that we need to consider. Uh, first of all it are the uh, Panmunjom and Pyongyang joint declarations. We can resume inter-Korean talks uh, through food and health care and forestry cooperative uh, projects as mentioned in those pieces of documents. Secondly, there are already North Korean humanitarian projects that the ROK government is doing through WFP, FAO, UNICEF and other multilateral organizations. Thirdly, the ROK government can work together with a third country or international organizations to do a uh, good to good trade with North Korea and other private sector exchange. Fourthly, we can engage in knowledge sharing projects to try to enhance inter Korean cooperation. In particular, uh, North Korea wants to enhance its food security, so perhaps the ROK can engage in exchange of farmers or agricultural supports, especially in the Gangwon-do province. The Taesongdong village and Gisongdong village lie near the DMZ border. So perhaps those residents uh, can be mobilized to engage in joint agricultural projects. This would lead to the enhancement of the quality of lives of the citizens living there. And this could bring about an actual experience of unification when unification does occur. There are many different issues regarding the establishment of a peace regime of the Korean Peninsula, uh, North Korea. China, U.S., there are many counterparts, many uh, interested stakeholders involved, but as you know, their opinions and their positions are very different. There are differences across the board in all of their opinions and all of their positions. And some people argue that the four parties uh, should not be the only ones who sit at the table. There should be more or maybe even fewer parties who get to sit at the table. And also, the U.S. and China are very passive when it comes to the establishment of a peace regime of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, there are differences of their positions, including uh, um, dependent on certain issues. There are vast differences between the U.S. and North Korea, but the North North Korean regime and Chinese regime have some similar stances when it comes to denuclearization and peace regime which comes first, and arms control, and USFK, and UN Command, North Korea and China have a similar positions. This could be a challenge for the United States. And this is something where an ROK has to find some countermeasures. We need to coordinate among these different differences and opinions to try to bring go into an actual peace regime. Going forward, the order on the Korean Peninsula can take the form of one of four scenarios. It could be a violent division or a peaceful division or a violent unification or a peaceful unification. From the point of view of uh, ROK, the best case scenario would be a peaceful unification. However, whatever outcome the form takes, we need to have the uh, supports of the international community, including the surrounding nations. That to do so, we need to 
persuade and convince all of the different players that unification is much safer and it will bring about more regional security and prosperity than division. And I think the best way to do so is to try to engage in multilateral talks with four parties. For us to move towards a peaceful unification, firstly, the unification issue was something where we have to bring in inter-Korean cooperation and international cooperation as well. And unlike the German case, we shouldn't see this as a way of uh, punishing. The, the division of the Korean Peninsula was not a way of c punishing war criminals. This was a byproduct of the uh, Cold War. So that should be the starting points of all of our discussions regarding unification of the Korean Peninsula. And thirdly, we have to take a gradual and peaceful and reciprocal way towards uh, peace and unification on the uh, Korean Peninsula. We should not make it a radical process. That is the only way for us uh, to try to move towards unification and that is something that the international community can be on board with. Thank you. We've just heard from our five panelists. Very interesting remarks indeed. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this um, session, as I've heard uh, from our panelists, there are about five questions that I'm going to ask each and every one of you. And I'll ask you to respond to those questions uh, for about three to five minutes. You may uh, talk about areas that are uh, that may not be uh, directly rela uh, related to those questions. If there is anything that you would like to um, add further, then you're welcome to do so as well. So, Mr. Dan Smith, Director, um, as I was listening to you. Hmm. you in your comments, you talked about the historical experiences of European countries, and they are very important historical lessons that we can pull from the European case, where the comprehensive and the individual cases were looked at together. They did not, in fact, see uh, the CSCE as the ultimate solution. Uh, before this happened before Glasnost and Perestroika. But after those experiences in the USSR, they saw a post uh, Cold War era coming in uh, to Europe. So, what I'm curious is for Northeast Asia and Korean Peninsula, if we were to take that kind of example for the Korean Peninsula, How should we accept our version of glasnost and perestroika? Because a glasnost and perestroika brought about a huge upheaval in the USSR. Uh, so what is our best way to try to have a peaceful resolution of uh, all events and make it lasting? So that is my first question to you, sir. And uh, my question then goes to Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom. In your presentation, you mentioned that COVID-19 and these um, disasters uh, could be a crisis and an opportunity at the same time. So we have to um, start our dialogue focusing on this human security related issues. And it could provide a small pathway towards facilitating dialogue uh, with the DPRK, which we fully agree with. Uh, but at the, what we have as a concern is that there are various small pathways that we can explore, but ultimately we have to see some substantial improvement in critical issues. So from the DPRK's point of view, that would mean denuclearization, peace regime, and a security guarantee for the DPRK. Because we have been closely monitoring the development of the Korean Peninsula, will there be any room uh, for uh, South Korea to take initiatives on? whether you're seeing it uh, from very close uh, distance or from afar, denuclearization, peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Um, it's really a, quite a challenging issue, and it is in a stalemate in a way. 
Is there any advice that you can give uh, to the Korean people in that regard? Um, to Director Ville Brumer, while listening to your comments, uh, there were two things that came to my mind. Uh, this talks about a comprehensive uh, security architecture. And I think that trying to establish uh, something of that nature would be very important. And at the same time, uh, another interesting point you made was uh, this aspect of symbolism. But for us uh, to go towards a comprehensive security architecture, I think if uh, that is going to be very important issue for us to go towards denuclearization and uh, peace regime right now because of the conflict between the US and China for us in the Asia Pacific theater for us to try to come up with a comprehensive and in-depth security architecture, would that be easy for us to accomplish uh, given the uh, nature of the U.S.-China conflict? And secondly, I also think that this there is this uh, very important aspect of symbolism that you uh, touched upon in your comments. And I think that can also be tied in with the notion of public diplomacy, which I think has very important implications for a session such as this one that we are sitting in today. You know, what the ROK can do is uh, something that we really can do. We can take some initiative. But when we look back in, at what happened in the 1970s, there is a, something called the Helsinki Accords. and for Europe, throughout that time, leading from 1970s to 1980s, these are smaller nations such as Sweden, Finland, Norway, these countries were able to go beyond the US-USSR conflict and really play a very important role, even beyond NATO. And I think that that definitely has some implications. If you can tell us how those countries, those Nordic countries, were able to accomplish that in the 70s and 80s, that would be helpful. And to Dr. Ellen Ware, our fourth panelist, um, your presentation was indeed very interesting. A question for you is this. The so-called uh, realistic uh, perspective and idealistic perspective, there's a dilemma between the two different perspectives. Let's say, for example, uh, you look at the uh, nuclear weapons free zone in Northeast Asia. There's, for example, civil society organizations in Korea or uh, peace um, experts and researchers are really putting a lot of thoughts to creating this uh, nuclear weapons free zone um, Asia. But the biggest challenge at hand is that those people that are in the actual policy making process, the relevant parties, especially the ones that have a nuclear weapons, those policy authorities, as well as the groups that are implementing those policies. How are we going to reconcile uh, with the position of these uh, policy makers and policy implementers? Otherwise, we deal with this uh, dilemma. The situation is not going to be easy in terms of the pace of uh, spreading the voice. There are going to be a lot of uh, constraints. So how do you reconcile with the interests of the policymakers? Uh, lastly, to Dr. Sa, I'm going to uh, ask you a rather more complicated question. And I really do hope that you won't be too disappointed that I'm asking a harder question. It's a bit of a curveball, but I hope uh, that you would give a sufficient response. 
I think that if we take a look at the current situation on the Korean Peninsula, there is COVID-19 bringing us a completely new world order and the U.S.-China tension that is really casting a gloom on the uh, Asia-Pacific theater. Even from people in other countries, many people are saying that you, the ROK should use this as an opportunity to take more of an initiative. Many countries are urging the ROK to do more. But what is your take right now? Because the U.S. and DPRK after Singapore and Hanoi, they were pretty much New Deal summits. And even after the presidential elections in the U.S. are over, there is always going to be that uh, ever-present security dilemma. So how much of an ROK initiative can we have? We have to convince U.S., we have to convince China, we have to convince DPRK, we have to convince all these other neighboring nations. What is the key point that we can use to convince and persuade all of these different neighboring nations and all of these different uh, stakeholders? And also, a second thing is that if we had a DPRK speaker here today at this session, what would that person say? Because the DPRK is also seeing a lot of uh, challenges. They are in a sanctions regime, and then that was coupled with COVID-19. So they are having really harsh uh, challenges right now. Uh, DPRK is facing a very severe dilemma. The North Korean leadership is facing a very severe dilemma. Uh, despite that, the DPRK is not really asking uh, more from the ROK. They're very tentative in asking the ROK for more of an engagement. So in light of that situation, how can we try to identify a breakthrough? I think earlier, uh, Director, uh, Dan Smith said that we have to take a very long-term perspective and we should not just give up now. It, it took the European countries about 10 years. They took a very long-term approach uh, to their security situation. When I was in Cypri about in the 1980s, I remember saying that, you know, it's perhaps the Korean experience is even more painful. So perhaps for us, it will take even longer than 10 years. Uh, but in any case, these are the uh, questions that I wanted to provide to you for the second round. Dan Smith. We will begin with uh, Director Smith. Yes, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, I think there are three points that I want to make. And I just want to say to start that your last question to the speaker from Kino, uh, Professor Yark, has means that I don't need to talk about um, who, who are the actors who will do these things. I can concentrate my mind on what I think should be done. Um, he has the curveball, as you put it. So the three points that I wanted to make are these. First of all, it's important to start out by recognizing that Glasnost and Perestroika arose because of contradictions within the Soviet system itself. They were driven by uh, economic weakness and social and demographic change inside the USSR. And what was needed, and perhaps what was the historical surprise, was a a mechanism, a transmission mechanism for bringing those pressures that were real and visible, I think, for quite a long time in Soviet society, especially in the cities, to bring those into policy within the USSR. And this is what happened when Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union. But the forces that were driving the change in the Soviet Union that led finally to its demise and to its breakup, and which were such an important part, therefore, of uh, bringing the Cold War to an end in the late 1980s, were domestically driven. They were internal questions in the USSR. They were not defined or achieved by what European or American diplomats were doing nor indeed, in my view, were they achieved by what the Pentagon uh, was doing, um, in, in 
increasing US military spending during the 1980s. I think change in the USSR was internally driven. At the time, as I said, in the 1970s, if we're looking back to try to understand what the real achievements of the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe and the mutual force reduction talks really were. At the time, the aim, and to some degree the achievement, was to manage a confrontation and to reduce the level of risk that was associated with it. In fact, after the Helsinki Final Act, and while the conventional force reduction talks were going on, came the period often referred to as the New Cold War and tensions between the USSR and the USA and their respective allied blocs increased uh, quite significantly from the end of 1979 through until uh, just after the accession to power of Mr. Gorbachev in the USSR. Nonetheless, a good case can be made for saying that the diplomacy of the 1970s made that confrontation perhaps shorter and certainly less risky than it would otherwise have been. But that's an achievement that is not related to glasnost and perestroika, and it's not really related, in my view, to the end of the Soviet Union. But there is an achievement which is related to that. And that is that because that diplomacy had reduced the level of risk, around the East-West confrontation, it actually allowed the changes in the USSR to unfold. It, create, it was part of creating an enabling environment for those changes to be happening. The argument within the Soviet Union about threat from the West was less persuasive, it was less convincing in 1985, 1986 than it had been more than a decade earlier. And this despite the, um, the rhetoric within the policies of the US administration under President Reagan in the first part of the 1980s, despite, for example, the evil empire speech. So on the one hand, you have changes being driven for internal reasons, internal factors in the USSR. On the second hand, you have the uh, the diplomacy which manages the confrontation and reduces the risk. And on the third hand, you have the, at the time, perhaps unexpected or perhaps dreamed of wish, uh, effect that when change began in the Soviet Union, there was nothing that was coming from the West that blocked that change. That, I think, is what we could look forward to in a, uh, a longer, longer perspective about the, the Koreas, that if there comes a time when North Korea begins to change under its own momentum for reasons which are North Korean reasons rather than American, Japanese, South Korean, or even Chinese or Russian reasons, if and when North Korea begins to change like that, the important thing is to have achieved the diplomatic environment, which means there is nothing external that blocks that change. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas Wenstrom. Could I have your uh, view, please? Uh, well, uh, it's a bit of a <laughs> stretch, but um, when we're talking about North Korea, it's, uh, the denuclearization is, is so far in the future, if ever, uh, simply because uh, the security threats that we see is, is United States and it's China. It's not um, uh, ROK, it's not Japan necessarily. But I see this as a scale where we're looking at human security, risk reduction, crisis management, that leads to a peace regime of sort and that could potentially de lead to denuclearization. But I think there's um, a management of expectations that is, is needed here, uh, where we uh, are okay and the international community needs to 
first of all, uh, figure out what they need, what, what the priorities are, what the value for each of these steps are. If you cannot have denuclearization, what do we want to accomplish? Uh, do you want to accomplish some sort of um, diplomatic engagement that could um, uh, sort of ease up a future change? Uh, but I think that the, the, re the more realistic perspective is needed, that we, where we can actually see that uh, what we're trying to do is increase security for ROK. We're trying to provide that platform if change happens. But I think we, we, we're not going to look at that. And, and, and this is a challenge because if you can ask the North Koreans, the North Koreans' answer is very simple. Lift the sanctions, uh, reduce the threats against RK, uh, sorry, against DPRK, and we can discuss everything. The problem is, this is a catch-22 situation. Once you reduce the threats against North Korea or the sanctions, they don't have any incentives to denuclearize or change. And if you keep the pressure on uh, DPRK, they will not change either because they, they need the nuclear weapons to, to guarantee their own security. So how do we sequence this to maximize the potential for change and increase security for North Korea? Because from the North Korean perspective, they are under severe threat. And I think this is something that we should not underestimate. They truly believe that the international community is after them, uh, and therefore they need uh, nuclear weapons. So for me, there's, there's really no other way forward than to take these small steps in human security, risk reduction, crisis management, but maybe not reward DPRK too early. We need to have a firm position on DPRK until something substantial happens. So my advice to RK is to keep your eyes on a positive target, but don't reward DPRK too early because we need to be realistic about the future. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Next, uh, Mr. Billy Brumer. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of points. Firstly, on the on the uh, uh, going back to the OSCE, which I think that the uh, uh, Dan Smith described uh, uh, very well. I want to just point a couple of additional elements, which I think are very critical on on actually leading uh, to the signing of the agreements. And uh, in general, I think that it's clear that the um, uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, have been had been lobbying for such agreement uh, uh, since the early 60s. <laughs> but only late 60s, uh, the um, interests of the other states as well started to merge <laughs> on, on, on creating that mechanism. Uh, and I think that uh, looking at how it is done, <laughs> uh, it's important uh, uh, not only look at the interests of the big powers. But it was also the questions of interest of small, medium sites and big powers. And between those, and interests of small states vis-a-vis -vis their own sponsors, vis-a-vis -vis the other small states, vis-a-vis -vis the other sponsors. <laughs> so I think that the uh, 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 the how to say complexity the, of the interest and merging of those interests, I think that was the um, was the key. And I think that one of the symbolic elements there was the Prague 68 events, <laughs> where uh, each of these actors saw, uh, how to say, the risk of what can happen <laughs> if nothing is done. <laughs> from a different perspective. So it's not the only big and small, uh, but the uh, uh, big, big and big, but also small. And especially what comes to diplomatic efforts, I think that the extra effort was done by many of the small states because of their uh, 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 own specific uh, uh, interests. 
but I think that the uh, looking at the oversea and the evolution, uh, I think that that's that's a context specific. <laughs> there can be lessons learned, but I think that it can be certainly uh, replicated uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, 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 in the in anywhere else. I see uh, what is key in the uh, uh, peace process in, in the Korean Peninsula in the in, in uh, short to midterm is the um, uh, connectivity of the DPRK to the international community. <laughs> because I think that whatever challenge you see, uh, I think that the big challenge is that there's no understanding on the sequencing in the international community. And what uh, Nicholas was uh, uh, describing extremely well, I think that that cannot be done. You cannot find uh, formulas without the connectivity uh, uh, to the international community. And all in all, I think that the um, if you assume <laughs> that the um, that the uh, 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 nuclear weapons are. <laughs> uh, 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 how would say can be replaced as a security guarantee as something else that requires a connectivity <laughs> to the to the rest of the world and i think that this is something uh, where i feel that uh, uh, there's a need for more work and allowing the symbolism and all kind of efforts <laughs> because without that we are always locked and, and uh, I see uh, 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 Dan Smith, um, uh, the philosophy of, of waiting, uh, that uh, uh, something to happen in inside, inside Korea. But I think that the, uh, whether it changes or not changes uh, inside the DPRK, I think that the connectivity is the, is the key. Um, fully agreeing with Nicholas, for example, that you <laughs> you cannot give the open <laughs> open box, but still, that's something which is needed. Thanks. So, thank you very much, Dr. Ellen Ware. Yeah, thank you very much, and I appreciate very much the question about uh, the engagement of policymakers in this proposal, this idea for a nuclear weapon-free zone in Northeast Asia. Um, I will look at policymakers, both government officials and parliamentarians and the engagement. But just before I give specifics on that, uh, I did just a quick overview of the nuclear weapon free zones to give context. We already have nuclear, regional nuclear weapon free zones in many parts of the world, covering all of Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Pacific, Central Asia, Southeast Asia and Antarctica. And in most of them, not all, but most of them, uh, nuclear weapons had been engaged in some way in security roles, in the uh, deployment of nuclear weapons, in the testing of nuclear weapons, or even the possession uh, in some of the countries within the regions. And the nuclear weapon-free zones helped facilitate a, re a reduction or a total elimination of the reliance on nuclear weapons by countries in the region. So they provide another uh, context for being able to move forward and support a denuclearization process that has been successful in other regions. And each one has been a little different and they've had to model the type of nuclear weapon-free zone differently. So now what have been some of the discussions amongst the parliamentarians and government officials? I'll start with some of the parliamentarians. Um, so about six years ago, uh, there was a number of events uh, for a few years, uh, six to eight years ago, um, starting in both the Japanese and South Korean parliaments. Uh, and uh, in the South Korean National Assembly, there were a number of events that hosted uh, cross-party by Mi Kyung Lee, who's no longer a parliamentarian. She's now the uh, head of COICA, the Korea Overseas Cooperation Agency. But there was very interesting, uh, as I said, cross-party discussion on that. Out of those discussions, both in the Korean National Assembly and the Japanese Diet, the National Assembly, emerged a joint statement of Korean and Japanese parliamentarians supporting the idea of a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone 
from the Japanese side and included a two former foreign ministers, uh, one parliamentarian who's now the defence minister, Taro Kono, um, and the, the Democratic Party of Japan actually pr then produced a model treaty, you know, based on this idea of win-win, a three plus three approach um, as a possibility. Um, also, uh, with regard to the parliamentarians, there has been dialogue on the sides of the inter-parliamentary union assemblies. That's 178 parliaments, are party, uh, members of that, including China, Russia, DPRK, ROK and Japan. Not the United States, though. But in there, there's been an opportunity to engage with DPRK parliamentarians. Um, who are normally basically just relaying messages back to the for their foreign ministries uh, in DPRK, but it gives an indication that there's an interest from the DPRK in this proposal. Uh, in Geneva, there have also been some informal discussions of the disarmament ambassadors um, and the disarmament councillors of the six uh, countries. Um, and there was generally interest from all of them uh, during the Obama administration, but that interest sort of waned during the Trump administration that didn't, wasn't really paying that much attention to this particular proposal. They were following a different track. Uh, then more with the officials in December last year in Seoul, I participated in this. There was an Institute of Foreign Affairs and National Security event. Um, on uh, peace and denuclearization in Northeast Asia. It was hosted by the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of the ROK, the Minister of Foreign Affairs spoke, and there was one whole session on this proposal in the Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone uh, where it was discussed. It's also been picked up by the Asia Pacific Leadership Network and uh, Mongolia, um, the government has offered to host uh, any deliberations or negotiations on that, if that's something which is of interest to the six parties. Mongolia has already set themselves up as a single state nuclear weapon free zone. So there's a lot happening on this issue. It hasn't yet come out into any official policies from the countries, but it indicates that there definitely is general interest uh, in the proposal from the parties. Yeah, come on. The time is going. Session is going. Yes, thank you very much. I think we are uh, almost close to uh, ending our session. But uh, we would like to hear from uh, Dr. So. If we have maybe one or two questions from the floor, we will take those questions before we close. Dr. So, will you respond? Uh, I think when we take a look at the current U.S.-China tension, yes, there is uh, some level of conflict there, uh, a rising a heightened tension. But if there is another administration, then perhaps that could change around uh, the structure of the U.S.-China tension. Uh, if some people take a look at the U.S.-China relations and see that as a condominium or a cartel, uh, perspective. So there are different perspectives that we can choose from to look at the U.S.-China uh, tension. And also, during the Cold War, we witnessed uh, Europe uh, going beyond regional uh, security and try to really be very strong in coming up with their own regional security architecture. Uh, there was that uh, proposal of uh, coming up with uh, weapons, and there were those uh, rival nations coming together and sitting down to try to talk about arms reduction, especially with conventional weapons. So I think that the peace and security in the Korean Peninsula right now for us, we don't have the ripe conditions as Europe had in the 70s and 80s. We don't still have the necessary conditions. And I think many countries can be blamed for that, all the neighboring countries, in fact, DPRK, after Kim Jong-un came in, they tried to uh, engage in negotiations with uh, ROK and with the U.S., but uh, they have very high level of expectations. And when the Hanoi deal, uh, Hanoi summit ended as a New Deal summit, that really led to discouragement. And we talk about the future initiative of ROK. Are we going to exchange peace for letting uh, North Korea maintain its uh, nuclear armament? Or what are we willing to give up? I think that is a very important question mark for all of the neighboring countries, the great powers especially. And that will lead to an, the, a different outcome for Northeast Asia and for Korean Peninsula. And all of our countries have to pull our ideas together. What is the initiative that ROK can have? 
I think that we are very structurally restricted, but the U.S. and China channel and the U.S. and China normalization will be very important when it comes to any talks regarding weapons of mass disruption. Oh, I think that the ROK needs to try to find some wisdom to go beyond that. I think we have to look back and review our past record. What can we do to try to uh, engage in more human security, for example, to try to be better at negotiating going forward? So we have to look back over our and do a past review of our past record. And lastly, for the peace process, I, I don't think that uh, ending the war and denuclearization is not the necessarily the ultimate objective of peace process. I think our ultimate objective ought to be how can we achieve human security through the peace process? Because these days people are talking about quality peace when it comes to life, uh, dignity, and all these different uh, elements of life. They have to be sustainable in nature. And to do so, we have to have dispute resolution. So the peace process's ultimate objective is human security, not necessarily just the nuclearization or just an end of war, especially because we're seeing climate crisis and uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics. We have to be more open in how we define peace process. Uh, um, I think we had some questions from our online participants as well. But I believe uh, their questions have been answered uh, naturally in the course of uh, getting responses from our panelists. So I'm not going to use um, this time to ask questions back to our speakers again. As I mentioned before, the beginning of the session, I don't think that I'll have to give you a summary of this discussion thus far. But over the last uh, 90 minutes or so, we've had this very uh, important discussion today. Uh, from the policy perspectives, not only uh, the Republic of Korea, DPRK, China, Russia, the United States, as well as European nations, it really requires uh, their close attention in terms of policy perspectives. And second point that I want to um, address is that there has to be a discourse uh, in Korea on this topic. And I believe that the session was very useful in facilitating the discourse in Korea. The last but not least, what I want to share with you as a hope is that we really should have a physical person-to-person -person discussion on this topic. Because of the situation in Seoul, we're required to wear our masks during and throughout the session. But it would be nice to be able to take off our masks and have a heated debate and discourse with every one of you again in the future. We thank you very much for your insights, your wonderful presentations, as well as comments. And at the same time, I would like to also take this opportunity to thank our online participants. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to conclude session two.